Hey, howdy, everybody. Well, you knew this day would come. We did the calculations of Veragrams. We talked about interpretation. And now, Veragram modeling. This is critical because when you think about it, everything we're doing, you know, right at the very beginning, we introduced this idea. Spatial continuity matters. You've got to be able to quantify it. And now we got to be able to model with it. So Veragram modeling is all about how do we take a measure of spatial continuity and make it into a model that we can use for the purpose of spatial estimation and simulation. Now, once again, just in case you feel lost, if you feel like this has been going on for way too long, all the spatial continuity talk, here is the kind of the strategy. It all comes down to we need to practically calculate a model spatial continuity. We've got to work with sparse, you know, whatever data we got to work with. So we talked about some of the hurdles to being able to do this, and that included how do we deal with irregularly spaced data, and that was the whole idea around search templates and all the parameters to determine the search template. I hope um, you've got the idea now that that search template and all those parameters is very analogous to how do you bin a histogram, how much, how much tolerance do you allow to smooth out noise versus if you use too much tolerance, are you starting to smooth out information? That type of balancing act. Combined with the fact that we want spatial continuity models that are in specific directions, and so we want to account for that. And we want to cope with whatever data we have available. So the next steps we need is we need a valid spatial model. We need to work with spatial models, functions that are known to be valid. They don't result in spatial paradoxes. They don't result in crazy estimation variances and so forth. And we'll get into this. We'll talk about what are these sets of spatial models that we know will be valid. And then we got to be able to build a systematic full three-dimensional or two-dimensional representation of spatial continuity. This is Veragram modeling, and this is what this section is all about. That was dramatic. All right, so reasons for Veragram modeling. Once again, notice the acknowledgement at the bottom of the slide. There are a couple slides here that are taken directly from Clayton Deutsch's graduate level course over there at the University of Alberta. Appreciation to Clayton for allowing me to use course material in my courses. I do appreciate that. Thank you. So why do we need to do Veragram modeling? Well, there's two points here. The first one is that we need to know the spatial continuity for all possible lag distances. And remember when we calculated Veragram, we specifically plotted the Veragram, the experimental Veragram, as points. Because we know something about spatial continuity at those points, but it's not really providing us information between all of the points. But we need to go between all the points because, in fact, when we are estimating and simulating, we're going to encounter data configurations at distances of any lag, not just the ones at which we calculated. So we need to know information about spatial continuity between the points. In addition, you remember that we calculated spatial continuity in the directions, primary directions, major horizontal, minor horizontal, vertical, so forth. And these are orthogonal to each other. And so this could be a major, this could be a minor. But when it comes to modeling and estimation, we need to know the Veragram for all possible directions, not just the primary directions. And so we need to be able to know spatial continuity in all possible directions over all possible distances. In fact, the specific lag offset distance and direction may not even be available in our data. So when we think about it, this is a modeling step. We're formulating a consistent three-dimensional spatial continuity model going beyond what was available in the data to something that describes all possible distances and directions. I just think it's wonderful. So this is what we have to do. We also, modeling is not just about curve fitting. There's an opportunity here to bring in our geo knowledge. We may have a set of experimental Veragram points that came to us from our calculation. We've done that very well, I imagine. But in addition to that, maybe we have understanding about anisotropy ratios that comes directly from outcrop geology or maybe from very good high resolution seismic information and we want to bring that into the model. This is a perfect opportunity. 
bring your geo interpretations, your geophysical interpretations, all of it in to the Veragram modeling step. So this is a chance to put our geo knowledge in. In addition, and this is very important, the Veragram model must be positive definite. It must be a legitimate measure of distance. What does this mean in practically speaking? That when we go around and use the Veragram for estimation and simulation problems, the estimation variance that's calculated by any combination of data that's available to us using the spatial continuity model must result in valid variances, non-negative variances, and so forth. And so we need to build models that are known to be valid, that they won't result in some crazy type of contradictions or what I'd like to deem as spatial paradoxes. And so Many of my students kind of struggle with this concept of spatial paradox, so I put together this very simple example. Now note, this is kind of cartoonish, but it, it does illustrate the potential problem. So let's give ourselves an extreme example to demonstrate the need of using positive definite Veragram model. So this one right here is going to be my Veragram model. I just made it up. I think it's great. I want to use it all the time. Let's test it. Let's see how it behaves. So what does my Veragram model do? Well, it says that you have a Veragram value of zero up to a distance r. And then at that point, it jumps all the way up to a Veragram value equal to the sill. What is that? That's a model that has perfect correlation up to distance r. And beyond distance r, it becomes no correlation. Okay, so let's see if that works. Let's give ourselves a spatial example and see if that will result in a spatial paradox. So I cooked myself up an example. I got data, I got a point, data point A, B, and C. Data point A and B are a distance separation less than R, just barely, less than R. Data point B and C are also at a distance less than R. They're, they're pretty close together, in fact, they're very close. But the distance between A and C is now a distance greater than R. Okay, so what do we learn from that? Well, this model, my model of spatial continuity, will predict that A and B are perfectly correlated. Perfectly correlated. Wonderful. B and C are perfectly correlated. Perfectly correlated. A and C are not at all correlated with each other. There's no correlation. So what do we have? A perfectly correlated with B, perfectly correlated with C, but A and C are not at all correlated. That's a spatial paradox. Now, you might look at that and say that was pretty obvious. You kind of cook that up and so forth. The point is, if you just took your experimental variogram points and you fit a function to it, a spline or any type of function, and you ran that through all the possible configurations of data and distances and offsets and so forth, that you'd find circumstances and circumstances under which your model would result in this type of spatial paradox not as glaring perhaps but it would not be spatially consistent with itself between all of the data positive definite variogram models ensure that for all possible spatial configurations there will be no paradoxes they're valid okay so i hope that motivated or explained why we have to work with a certain set of functions that are positive definite. Now I explained it through using kind of almost a, a very simple example, but kind of extreme. But what do we say in general around this idea of positive definiteness? Well, the Veragram is going to be used in Kriegen. Even in simulation, it's used within Kriegen. And Kriegen is going to use a lot of these Veragram values. In fact, it's an entire matrix representing a linear system of equations, all based on Veragram values. They're converted to covariances, but we learned before that's just basically flipping the Veragram upside down. Sil minus Veragram is equal to covariance. Same thing, okay, as far as having to model it valid. Now, the Kriegen system will solve for the estimation variance, and we will get into this later, but you'll see that it involves also a whole bunch of covariance values. And if you were to just fit a smooth representation of your experimental Veragram, I guarantee you that this variance will not be valid. You'll have, in fact, 
there will be many cases where you have very unrealistic values for the variance. Very large variances that just don't make sense. Very small variances, negative variances. All kinds of things will happen with regard to the variance. And it won't, so it won't be valid, it won't be useful to us. We need that estimation variance. As you'll see later on, it's essential. So that's the bad news, is that we need to model with a set of positive definite structures. But it's not bad news because in fact, we have a lot of really good structures to work with. And you'll find out soon that we nest them together, we can add them together and build up a very nice set of directional variograms or considering all possible distances and directions that are valid. And so we're fine. So let's get into the different types of positive definite variogram structures that are permissible, the ones that we're allowed to work with. So behold the grandeur of the nugget effect. This is it right here. Cool, eh? Okay, so what's the nugget effect? If you look at the function for the nugget effect, well, with every one of them, we'll have a designation nugget contribution. That's going to be the sill that we're going to use. And, and so if we just had nugget effect for the entire phenomenon, it would be the sill, the variance of the problem. Or the contribution could be some portion of the variance. We'll, we'll see later as we start to build nested variograms. At a distance of zero, it's zero. We, would that make sense? A distance of zero, what is the measure of the variogram? Well, it's the value minus, minus the value itself. It's zero for every possible pair because we're always dealing with the data in itself. That would have a average sum of squares divided by two must be equal to zero. So it makes sense. All spatial phenomena and everything should have at a zero distance offset a varigram value of zero. But at some distance, very short distance, epsilon distance, mathematically infinitesimal distance, the varigram model, as soon as you are not zero, anything greater than zero, the nugget effect jumps up to its contribution. Contribution one here. And so it is a discontinuity right at the origin jumps up. Now, the thing I want you to notice is that it's zero spatial continuity. It's a random model, okay? Complete spatial random. It's often mixed in with what we do. It'll often be a small component of many variogram models we build, and you'll see that. We'll talk about that. What else can we say? There's no parameters to the nugget effect. You put the contribution, but aside from that, there's no range parameters because the nugget effect is acting in all directions. It's not, and there's no range parameter. There's no directionality. Okay, it's just all directions, just randomness, that proportion of the variance. Okay, nugget effect. The spherical. So here we got the spherical right here. So the spherical is very commonly used. Its functional form is right here. It also has a bit of a, well, it's a, it's a piecewise function from the standpoint that at values less than the range, you use this function right here, quite simple function. And then when you're past the range, it just becomes equal to the contribution. Okay. The other thing that you should notice is that with the spherical, now we have a, we're considering distance and range. Every time we show an A, that's a range. Now you'll see later on that that can be a full three dimensional consideration for range. Right here, we're just showing it as the ratio of the lag distance divided by the range. So we're effectively, we're standardizing the structure such that it can be stretched or squeezed to any range that we want to work with. We could change the A and it would just stretch this function out. Not a big deal, okay? The next thing we'll observe with the spherical is it does have a linear structure that if you extend it up to the sill would be equivalent to two thirds of the range. That's interesting. And so in general, very linear, um, increase in variability with distance, and then it has a rollover, and then it becomes constant at the sill. Very common, many spatial phenomenon have this structure. Now, you might ask me, how do you know it's positive definite? It's kind of cool, because you can actually find out that the spherical variogram is actually the result of a spatial phenomenon. In full 3D, it is the volume of a sphere if you were to take the sphere and you were to intersect it with itself and you start pulling those two spheres apart, if you take the volume of, of the sphere, subtract the intersected volume, that is the spherical function. And so what's cool about it? Well, from a theoretical perspective, 
it has a physical reality. And so at the heart of the idea of this being positive definite working in space, it makes sense that it is based on a spatial phenomenon. So I, I just, I find that kind of cool. Not necessary for what we're doing right now, but it is interesting. The exponential. The exponential is another one. It also has a linear but much steeper linear behavior in the short distances. If you linearly extrapolate, it goes to about one third of the range now. So you can see in the short distance, it has much more discontinuity, but then it has a rollover. And in fact, it reaches the sill asymptotically. The range is, has to be characterized as the fraction of the sill since it never reaches the sill. 95% of the sill, we will call that, we call it, and we say that that's the range. The equation is shown down here below, just like the spherical, we're working with a h vector or an h distance, I should say, that's going to be normalized by the range. If we're working in full 3D, you'll see that we have to combine all of those separate ranges and distance offsets in each direction together, and we'll do that geometrically, not a big deal. And so, in general, how do we compare and contrast the spherical and the exponential? The similar is spherical, but it rises much more steeply and reaches sill asymptotically. Many natural phenomena also have the exponential type of feature. Aha, the Gaussian. The Gaussian is very different than both of the previous. Now, look at what it does. In the very short distances, it has incredible spatial continuity, very smooth, short scale type of behavior. Then it rises up towards the range, and like the exponential, it's reaching it asymptotically. And so at some 95%, we'll call it and say it's close enough to the sill. This model does often get used, often in phenomenon that we expect short scale continuity. Where's an example of that? Thicknesses, topography, things like that tend to have short scale continuity. They don't tend to jump around a lot. A thickness of something, you know, there's angles of repose and so forth. Topography tends to not be, if we're not in the mountains, we don't expect it to jump a lot. And so we expect smooth short scale behavior. Gaussian can be used there. The equation, just like the spherical and exponential, we're dealing with the lag distance h normalized by the range. And of course we can do that in full 3D and we'll explain that shortly. Now I borrow this slide, actually I took this directly out of the lecture series by Professor Jeff Kerr's over at Stanford University. He has a great set of lectures on geostatistics, specifically around spatial continuity and other topics. And I really enjoyed watching those lectures this summer. And so Jeff, I hope it's okay. I grabbed a screen capture. I really liked your idea here. And that is, many people wonder, what is the value of considering in detail the short scale behavior of a variogram? And so if we look at them, we have the spherical, the exponential, and the Gaussian. And he's created multiple functions that have those specific short scale features, all with the same range. And if you look at them, you can see the Gaussian to anything else, wow, what a difference. Just like we talked about before, short scale continuity that would be reminiscent of a property in space like topography, thickness, and so forth. There's not a lot of jumping. The spherical, we see some type of pretty good persistence, but still some significant variability in the short scale. With the exponential, now we're seeing a much larger degree of variability in the short to the medium distances, and, but then you maybe you have persistence at the longer ranges, and so you're seeing that combination right there. So very fascinating, very cool. Okay, common models that we can work with. We covered the, the mighty nugget effect right here. The spherical, the exponential, the Gaussian. There is, of course, the whole effect model. It's a periodicity model that's very cool, that often we see periodicity. Not practically really used in simulation, estimation. Usually we'll model the trend of cycle and remove it. The dampened hole effect is very interesting. A little bit of deeper knowledge. It turns out that if you take the product of multiple positive definite models, they them, that product is positive definite, not just the addition, as we'll show with the nested variogram approach shortly. And so if you take an exponential and apply it or, or multiply it by a hole effect, 
you get the dampened hole effect. And we often see that natural phenomenon, but, but once again, the hole, hole effect type features, we often model it by trend, and then we'll go ahead and work with the residual, and the cyclicity has been removed now, and we can use these other four structures. So we will focus on these four structures for all of our modeling. All right, so let's talk about the two-dimensional varigram, and let's, let's get into some points around that. First of all, one of the best ways to illustrate and to think about a two-dimensional varigram calculation is to consider the idea of a varigram map. And so up until now, we calculated all our varigrams in primary directions. 200 meters is the horizontal minor at a 135 azimuth. And at the 45 degree azimuth, we have 350 meters as the major horizontal right there. So we can calculate the varigram, and that's fine. That's a good varigram calculation. I should mention that these plots that I'm showing right now are based on the geostatistics pi set of functions I put together, not a real package, but set of functions that run GeoSlide in the background executables, but have re-implemented all of the plotting for streamlining workflows. Only works on Windows, but um, still pretty useful. It's on GitHub if anyone's interested. The varigram map is a very interesting calculation. Where is, instead of calculating the varigram just in the two primary directions, what we do with the varigram map is you imagine this is a mesh. In fact, every one of these locations is a cell at a certain distance offset from the center. The distance, I mean the center, would be 0, 0, 0 and x, 0 and y. That's at the origin. That's at the, you're comparing data with themselves. That by definition is equal to 0. It's effectively like the zero on a regular varigram plot. Then, as we move in this direction, we're increasing the distance in the primary direction, so we could calculate the varigram over this vector. We could do that. But why not take every other possible look cell and calculate its offset, a direction and distance, and calculate the varigram in that direction too. Now you might wonder, because we did all that work on the search template, what is the search template here? The search template, in fact, is the cells. You have a mesh of cells at a pretty high resolution. You can tell if you, you look at this, this is pretty high resolution. And so we just take, in fact, this as a template with a regular grid of cells, put it on top of each location, calculate all of the possible pairs, move it, repeat, move it, repeat, and you get a varigram map. Now caution, we can build the varigram map when we have a full exhaustive model. No problem, right? Because we have a lot of data. We have the entire exhaustive data set. We know every location. If you have a limited set of wells, typically a varigram map will be very difficult to calculate. It's even more data is required for a varigram map than a regular directional varigram. So that's the main cautionary thing. Why do we calculate it? Why do we show it? It's good for people to understand that there is a varigram map. It's also very useful when it comes to understanding concepts of geometric anastropy and the reality. Well, look at this ellipsoid representing geometric anastropy. You can, in fact, see the contour on the varigram map. It exists. It actually works. So this is very useful as it does show us this concept of we could have a structure that's describing the variability between 0 to 1, or effectively right up to the sill, so 100% of the variability. And that single structure defined by a minor range, 200, and a major range at 350, with the major in the direction 0, 4, 5, and the minor orthogonal to it, that that single structure can describe for all distances and directions a spatial continuity model over all of this variability right here. So, so you can get this idea that we can build a varigram structure that can work for all possible distances and directions and describe a component of the variance. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, we're going to calculate and model the varigram in a way that we can specify what, for each structure, what's the contribution. C1 is the contribution. What's the orientation? In the horizontal direction, what is the major azimuth? 0, 4, 5, or whatever it might be. What is going to be the type or shape 
of the structure. Now you notice in all three of these primary directions, it is in fact the same shape. It really is. It's the same shape. It's the same structure. They're all going to be spherical. Then we, the only thing we get to change in each direction is the range. So what we're doing is we have the same shape, the same contribution, but we're just stretching and squeezing that shape to match the specific range in the vertical, the horizontal major, horizontal minor. If we do that, we now have a directional variogram that can be using geometric anastropy. We have a model that's available for all distances and directions and describes this component of the variability. That's the basic building block of a varigram, a nested varigram. This is one single structure for all possible distances and directions with that component of the variability, C1. Now, how do we do it? How does it work practically? Well, the way it gets done, as I mentioned before, is you've got to pick the directions. So we've got the horizontal major, the horizontal minor, and the vertical. You've got to calculate the ranges in each one of those directions. And then the H lag is now going to be converted from each one of the H's in those major directions, or in those principal directions, I should say, by scaling them by the ranges in each one of those directions to a brand new scalar, which is a geometric distance that's now accounting for the ranges in each direction. So you can imagine if there's a big offset in the horizontal major, you could have a large H value, but if the range is very big, it'll counteract it. And so it's a rescaling of each one of the components. You could have no vertical displacement, but that may not matter. You still may have a large H because you have a large horizontal displacement, or you could have no horizontal displacement, very little vertical displacement, but the range in the vertical is very small, and you could have a big H then. And so this right here is the geometric anastropy model. Okay, so what's it mean? In order to specify an entire variogram structure describing a component of the variability, in 2D, all you need is the direction, the horizontal major, the horizontal minor range, so two range components. So the major, you want to know what azimuth that's in. Every time we talk about azimuth for the direction of a variogram, we're describing the major. So we got the direction for the major horizontal, we got the range for the major, the range for the minor, the amount of contribution. How much do we want the structure to contribute? If it's just one variogram structure describing all the variability, that's equal to the sill, and then the type of variogram. So with those basic parameters, we have a full two-dimensional model. Now in 3D, it gets a little more complicated. We have the direction the horizontal major is in. We have the dip. In 3D, you could be going at 0, 4, 5, but you could also dip at the same time. So we have to account for the dip too. Now, I should say that many problems we work in, the coordinate transformations have taken care of dip, and so often we are working with spatial continuity and mo characterization and modeling, which is aligned with the gridding structure, so we often have a dip of zero. We have the major minor range like we had before in the horizontal. And remember, even if we're dipping, I know it's not quite horizontal now, but it's in that direction that got dipped. Sorry about that, but that's, that's a convention. The vertical range is now added because we're in 3D, we need another range. The contribution for all of this, just like we had before, and the type of the variogram. And the type of variogram and the contribution are going to be constant over all of the directions. So we're just going to have one contribution, one type of variogram, even if it's 2D or 3D. Okay, so that's how we're going to specify it. How does nesting work? How do we build a nested variogram? What does it look like? So it turns out that the addition of positive definite variogram structures is positive definite. So each structure is going to cover a proportion of the sill. In other words, each structure is going to describe part of the variability of the spatial problem. That's, it's really cool, actually. So you have a lot of freedom and flexibility. And so for each structure, we can change the orientation, the range in the major, the range in the minor but within the structure in the different directions, we can only change the ranges. 
It's going to have the same orientation, the same contribution, the same type. We've already covered that on the previous slide. But the, the, each of the structures could have totally different directions and majors and minors and so forth. So we are spatially explaining the variance parts, the variance components. So let's take an example right here. Our first structure is nugget effect, right? It's just nugget effect. Over all distances, it's just equal to the contribution. So C1, nugget effect. Now, that nugget effect, just to say, is going to be in all directions, right? It's going to be in all directions. Now, this example right here is isotropic. We're not getting into the horizontal vertical yet. We're just talking about nesting. But this one would be nugget in all directions. Structure 2, C2, is going to be a spherical with a range of A2. Structure, and it's a kind of a short scale type of a structure. It's, it's not that long. It's shorter. Structure 3 is going to be another spherical with a much larger range, A3. Now, I mean literally, we're just going to add them together. In fact, mathematically speaking, you could take every single H between 0 and this distance right here, calculate the associated barogram value from each one of these valid positive definite barogram structures, spherical and nugget, and just sum them together, and this is our nested structure. So what do we notice about the nested structure? First of all, the nugget effect was just added in. So just add the nugget. You're going to start from the nugget effect. The short scale structure, 2, caused us to rise up. But then at the range of the short scale structure, we have a rollover. Not a rollover, more of an inflection point. What causes that inflection point? At that point, we stop having an increase in structure 2. It stops. So the rate of change of the composite structure starts to slow down. But we have structure 3 still kicking in, and so that causes this continuous rise until we get to the range of A3, or structure 3, which will then get us to the cell. Now we've described all the variability. We've gotten to the cell. The ultimate range of this composite, or nested, barogram will be the range of the longest structure, because that's where we reach the cell. Okay, so you can see now this gave us a lot of power. First of all, what's very cool, we can go both ways. We can, if we encounter this type of experimental barogram with this type of shape and inflection point and so forth, we can start thinking of it as being a combination of different spatial structures, each describing different components of the variance. That's cool. So that's, that's neat. We can also model and work with each one of these individual structures and use that to build a positive definite model. Okay, so and that would be positive definite. Each one of the structures was positive definite, and the addition of them is positive definite. Now, this nested frequencies is very cool, and I have to admit, in Professor Jeff Kerr's lecture materials, I saw some really good examples, and so I ended up working some combinations in order to illustrate too, very much, but giving credit to um, Jeff for the great idea of showing this and communicating this to students. I really like it. So I worked up a couple of examples. And I think these should help you understand how to do variogram modeling by thinking about nested spatial frequencies or nested components that describe the variability. Remember, the total variability is the sill, so describing different proportions of the sill. Okay, so what I did was I created a random phenomenon. It could be porosity. It's got a reasonable porosity range. So we'll call it porosity. It's isotropic, no directionality, has a range of 100 meters. The area that we're working with is 1,000 by 1,000 meters. So if you look at that, you can see 100, 100 meter or so spatial continuity results in that type of a texture geometry. It, makes, it, it seems to make sense. Then what I did was I took, and I gave it a sill of 4. That's just arbitrary. Remember, it doesn't have to be a sill of 1. It's only if you have a normalized variable that has a variance of 1. But I said, okay, it's porosity units. It has a sill of four. The, then I took another random field with the same isotropic 100 meter range, sill of four again. And I added them together. And this is the result right here. Now, I think the color bar is not great. I probably need to tune up the color bar a little bit. But in general, what you'll see is that the spatial continuity features are the same. We haven't 
dramatically change the spatial continuity features. The color bar looks a little bit off. I could switch that, but it's, it is the same. Okay, so what has happened here? Well, I thought it'd be very illustrative. I took structure number, I took structure, and I calculated its barogram. Structure number one has the blue barogram. Structure number two, I calculated its barogram. Structure number two has the green barogram. No surprises. The barograms are very similar to each other. There's a little bit of statistical fluctuation. We'll talk about that later. Those are ergodic fluctuations. They're not important. But in general, the same feature, same form. Then I add them together, of course, and I calculate the barogram, which is the black points here, for the addition of the two structures. Structure 1 plus structure 2 has a higher variance now because I did addition. There's an additivity of variance, and we'll talk about that later. But we've actually, I think we talked about in earlier um, discussions. So the variance is higher, so the sill is higher, but look at the range. Look at the shape. It's like we just took the two Veragram models and just stretched them to a higher sill. The range is exactly the same. So what is this telling us? It's telling us that if we take the contribution of a certain component or contribution one of a Veragram, and we take that same Veragram with the same parameters of range and everything, same shape, type of structure, and we take another contribution, it's going to be equal to a Veragram, that same Veragram, now with just a higher sill. This is very useful. So if we have a situation in which we want to model in one direction, so it looks like one single structure, all we have to do is keep the parameters the same, and we'll reach that higher sill, but using multiple structural components to get there. Okay, so this is very valuable, and we're going to use this when we go ahead and model Veragrams quite a bit. We'll use this trick, this method. So let's take, give ourselves another interesting example. So here what we did was we took isotropic 100 meter range, sill of 4 again. We add that to an isotropic 400 meter range. So we now increased it to much longer spatial continuity. Look at that. Big spatial continuity. Areas of low, areas of high. Here, it's all short scale. We add them together and look at what we get. We get a superposition of the resulting images, which results in a superposition of the variograms. And so let's look at what happens. So the first, the first structure, we calculate its variogram. It looks just like before, not a big deal. It's a spherical with a range of about 100. The second one, we've got such long range features with such a small space, the, the range is so large relative to the size of the space we're dealing with, that we're now getting into a realm where the whole thing looks like trend. It looks like a big trend. Lower here, higher here. You, you can see that, right? And so when we take the combination of the two structures, what do we get? Well, we get this superposition. Just like we saw before when we were showing the addition of multiple structures, we get the same thing and we've done it with real data. We've actually created the data sets, added them together and checked it. So this is showing us that when we work with multiple nested structures, it's in a Veragram, it's the same as if we took components of the variability and pulled them apart and modeled them separately. And that's really, really powerful. That's really cool. Okay, so here it is, like we got the range of structure one. It results in the same type of inflection point that we saw before when we were using nested structures. And we've got this long range trend that now is reflected in the combination here. Okay, how about this? This is kind of fun too. So isotropic 100 meter range, same as before. Now I just used a trigonometry just to build a very simple cyclic trend with a wavelength of 200 meters. Okay, so peak to peak, about 200 meters, trough to trough. Add them together. Now if you look carefully, you'll see it high, low, high, low. You recognize this, this example. I used it before in the previous lecture to talk about Veragram interpretation. Now what's very cool, if we take this example and we calculate the Veragram in the x direction, azimuth 0, 9, 0, in this direction, in this data set, it will rise to a pseudo sill that's equal to 77% of the ultimate sill. 77% was the variability 
in this short scale model that we combined with the cyclic trend. 23% was the variability within the cycle trend that we put into the model. So that's super cool. What that tells us is the directional variograms are able to see the components of variability that came from this feature right here, which is going to be the variability that's within the layers, included all the layers and all the layers. And this variability is going to be the variability between layers. And we see that directly in the expression of zonal anisotropy with this model. So what's this telling us? I hope this is building up the idea that variogram modeling is not abstract. In fact, we are decomposing spatial frequencies. And the spatial frequencies are describing different components of the variability of our problem. And so this is very, very powerful and very flexible. And we can do this all in a positive, definite manner with nested variogram structures. So let's go ahead and take another example here where we have a trend. So we're using the same 100 meter isotropic structure that we had before. We have a trend in Y direction, in the 0, 0, 0 direction. That trend describes 28% of the variability. 72% of the variance is captured within this isotropic 100 meter, and we add them together. If you look very carefully, you'll see this is more yellows and oranges. This is more blues and darker colors. So we, in fact, have a trend model now imposed. We go ahead and calculate the variogram in the 0, 9, 0 direction, in the X direction. This is orthogonal to the trend. The trend becomes invisible in that direction. What does that mean? In that direction, 28% of the variance is missing. This is cool. So we look in that direction, look. The variogram rises to a pseudo cell of 72%. That's super powerful. What happens in the other direction where we're going along the trend and we, st and we see the trend? We mirror the other direction. But then at a certain distance, it starts to kick in. You start to see trend features emerge. And so now we have that nice, clean looking trend type structure. And it rises for the rest right above the cell. And it keeps going. Very, very powerful. We can see clearly now that we are decomposing or breaking up and understanding different components of the variability. Now. This example right here, I should give credit to Professor Jeff Kares. There was this very similar example, and I created my own, basically based on what he had done. I thought it was so cool and a great way to communicate this concept of nesting of spatial structures. And so, like his example, what's here is we have an anastropic case, highly anastropic, in the 045, or in a direction like 045. We have another larger anastropic type structure, but it's orthogonal to the first. And so you see it's got much larger ranges, but it's orthogonal to it. And then we add those two together. Can you see the superposition? Short range continuity going this way, long range continuity going that way. Now this is the super cool part, is what actually happens is that if we look at the variograms that result, the red variogram points are in the 135 direction, this direction right here. What did they say? They say in the short range, there's a high degree of discontinuity. But then in medium to long ranges, there's pretty good continuity. Actually, in fact, greater continuity in the 135 direction. In the 45 degree direction, at very short distances, so going in this direction right here, it sees better spatial continuity than we saw in the other direction but then it loses it and becomes more dissimilar over larger distances. There's a switch in the major and minor directions based on what distance or scale we're talking about. And that is super, super cool. That's a really interesting thing. And you can look at the variogram, directional variograms, and if you see this type of crossover, that's what it's indicating. Now, always want to be careful. There could be noise. Um, just noise in the variogram calculations. Don't get too excited every time you see it. They have to be pretty systematic. You'd have to look at data and pre try to establish it. The other point about it, that if you're wondering right now, well, what is going to the range, which is the major, which is the minor, we'll keep the same convention as always. It is the direction with the greatest range 
and the range is right here. So 135 is going to be the major direction, even though in the short range it has poorer spatial continuity than the minor. And that's okay. That's okay because our convention will be based on the ultimate range when you reach the sill. Okay, so I thought this example is really, really neat, very interesting, very instructive. So let's go ahead and just talk about Varigram modeling. What, how are we going to do it? Well, the basic procedure, and once again, noticing credit for the slide here, you're going to pick the single lowest isotropic nugget effect. The nugget effect is over all possible directions. It's going to be effective in all of the principal directions. So you look for the lowest possible nugget effect and you pick it. You choose the same number of Varigram structures for all directions. You have to use the same structures in each direction. So you're going to bend the sill over all the possible directions directions, but it has to be the same contribution in each direction. So you're going to use the same bins. You're then going to modify the range parameters. You can modify the direction parameters too. You can model zonal anastropy by just setting the range parameter to be very large in a direction. So that's available to you. Okay, so it gives you a lot of flexibility. That's how we're going to proceed. Once again, software will help a little bit with these types of calculations. There's many types of um, guided type of paragram methodologies, but you're going to be, it's you have to take ownership for the modeling of the paragram. And so you're gonna to have to make sure that you have, that you build something that's going to be consistent. The software will make sure it's consistent, but it has to be consistent with the data and all the geologic knowledge. Okay, so let's give ourselves an example, a somewhat complicated case just to get kind of warmed up with this whole idea of varigram calculation. We've done a good job. We calculate the varigram in the vertical, the horizontal major, the horizontal minor. We have the experimental varigram points, green for the um, vertical and the horizontal minor, red for the major. Okay, now we're going to try to build a model. So the first step, that we showed on the previous slide is we're going to identify the lowest nugget effect and that's going to be our isotropic nugget effect. Vertical, at about 0.1, we are we were nugget effect up until about 0.1 of the total cell. Okay, so it would be one, that's 0.1 right there. We'll assume it's a normalized variable. In the horizontal major, it looks like nugget effect, but it's all the way up to 0.4. We can't put the nugget effect at 0.4 Otherwise, we'd be forced to have the vertical also have a 0.4 nugget effect because the nugget effect has no directionality. So we're still stuck at 0.1. 0.3, uh, maybe 0.3 for a nugget effect in the horizontal major. So we can only say there's nugget effect at 0.1. So first structure, nugget effect, contribution C1 will be 0.1. Okay, now we're going to break up the next structure. What's the next important thing that happens? Well, it looks like the horizontal minor thinks it has a nugget effect up to 0.3. Let's break that off and figure out what to do with it. Okay, so we're going to say we have a structure at 0.3. How are we going to decide what to do with it? Well, first of all, in the horizontal directions, it looks like nugget effect. So we can just set the range as zero. That will look like nugget effect in those directions, but it's not a nugget effect structure because nugget effect structure would be over all directions. But in that direction, there'll be no continuity. So it's not nugget effect, it's just no continuity in that direction. What's going on in vertical? Do you remember I showed you that example where we took multiple structures that were the same barogram or spatial continuities and we added them together and we got back the composite was basically the same thing with the same range, but just with the sill increased. Well, the vertical, if I look at the vertical, it looks like a single structure. I don't see any inflection points. There's no reason to believe that there's multiple frequencies combining here or anything. So what I'm gonna do right now is I'm just gonna say that vertical has a range of eight. And so I'll set range of eight. And, and for any possible structure afterwards, I'm gonna say range of eight. And so as we continue to add structures in, if we keep saying range of eight, we're going to get something that looks like this. It looks like a single vertical, the full contribution besides the nugget effect, range of eight. Okay. So we're done with structure number two. We've got structure number one, structure number two. So we're, we've described the variability up to point three. Point one was nugget, point two was the spherical. What's the next event? Well, 
at 0.4, so we need to have another contribution for 0.1 to get ourselves from 0.3 to 0.4. And this is where we see that we in fact have some spatial continuity in the horizontal minor, but in the horizontal major it still looks like no spatial continuity. How are we going to treat that? Well, we already said, well, it's going to be a spherical. We'll say spherical. We need it to be spherical so that we have a consistent shape and it looks like a single vertical, so that makes sense. Just keep everything spherical. 0.1 contribution, as I said before, we're always going to say 8, say 8, say 8 from now on when it comes to vertical. Then in the horizontal major, it still looks like no spatial continuity, so we'll just keep that as 0. And now we're going to say, well, it looks like we have a range of about 200 for this structure right now. So from point, so what we'll do is for point one, we're going to go ahead and say we have a 200 range. Now you might wonder, how do we decide 200 range? Well, it's the same principle we had before. For this contribution of point one and the contribution from point four to point eight, it looks like a single structure. So we're going to say 200, and we're going to say 200 for the next structure so that we get what looks like a single structure with a range of 200. Don't try to draw an intercept and say, well, it should be a range right here. No, because we want the addition of the two contributions to equal what looks like a single structure describing 0.5 of the variability from here to here. Okay, now structure four. So we're up to 0.4. We got to get from 0.4 to 0.8 because there's nothing else really interesting going on until 0 0.8. 0 0.8, spoiler alert, looks like Zonal tropy like a pseudo sill for us, right? So we want, to, we want to explain the next 0.4, or 40% of the variability. Okay, so what do we do there? 40% of the variability is the contribution 0.4. What are we going to say for vertical? Say 8. We're going to say 8. We just keep saying 8. Now, I can also say that for the horizontal minor, we're going to also say 200, just like we did before. So we have what looks like a single structure describing everything from 0.3 to 0.8. What changes? Now we start to see the 400, we pick a range for the horizontal major, and we do that by just looking at the structure, seeing where we reach this pseudo sill. Okay, so we got structure number four done. Structure number five, we got to finish off. We got to finish strong here. So basically we got 0.2 left. We've already described 80%. We got to explain the last 20%. So 0.2 contribution, still spherical. We're locked into spherical because we saw the verticals all one shape. We don't want to go changing that up. What do we say for vertical? Say 8, just like we did before, and we're done with vertical now, finally. Look at that. Four separate contributions of 8, spherical, every one of them, and they describe 90% of the variability resulting in this one single consistent structure. Pretty cool, right? All right, what are we going to do in the horizontals? Because we got zonal anastropy now. All we have to do is set the range to a very large number. In doing that, we cause the variogram model to level off. And so we, in the effective distances that we're looking at, up to 1,000, we're not going to observe any contribution or any increase in variability in that direction. That's how we get zonal anastropy. Okay, so we just built a pretty complicated directional nested variogram by using a bunch of different concepts. First concept, the nugget is isotropic, identify the lowest common contribution and assign uh, for nugget and you assign that as nugget. So basically you look for the lowest one. Can't make nugget 0.3, otherwise it would force us to put nugget up to 0.3 over here in the vertical because nuggets all directions, okay? The second idea was this idea around if you have one consistent structure all the way through, it's indicative that you have, maybe you have multiple nested structures, but they should be the same type and the same range in that direction in order to get that one consistent shape. The other idea, if you have intercepts with the zero distance that look like nugget in a direction but are not nugget in all possible directions, you can set the range to zero in order to get no spatial continuity in that, for that contribution for that direction. And that's what we've done here We've done here. Those are the zeros right there. The other idea, zonal anastropy, you get that by taking that contribution and assigning a range that's a very large number so that practically speaking it causes the variogram model to flatten off. Okay, so now I'll give you another example that you can work through on your own. 
this example right here, you should be able to use all the principles we just talked about in order to populate this table. Once you populate the table, you have formed a full three-dimensional nested variogram model that is going to be consistent. It is going to be positive definite. It can be used for estimation and simulation and you calculate it directly from directional experimental variograms that were calculated in the principal directions that were identified. So that's cool. We've gone from calculation to now closing the loop. You're able to build the spatial continuity models you need. All right, I'll start, stop talking. I'll count to three, and then I'll show you the solution. You can pause, of course, if you want to work through this. Three, two, and one. This is what I would do as far as building this variogram model. So let me just go through it very quickly. I would identify the lowest common nugget effect. I'd say it's around 0.3 of the contribution. Then I would go ahead and say, okay, 0.3 nugget effect is the type. That's structure number one. No range parameters required because for the nugget effect, it's all going to be in, it's in all possible directions and there's no range to nugget effect. It's all just random. Then I would look for the next interesting event. Well, at 0.4, we start to get Oh, sorry, at point 0.3 to point 0.4 is what we're interested in next because we have some differences here. We have something going on here versus here it looks like there's still no spatial continuity. And so we'll say a contribution point 0.1, we can put a spherical in for that. And so for that spherical, we could look at it and say, well, I want it to be a consistent shape over this length up to this extent right here. There seems to be an inflection point I want to capture. And so I'll say 6. Okay, so six is the, the range or the distance right there. But in the other two directions, the horizontal major and minor, there's still no spatial continuity, zero, zero. What's the next interesting thing? Well, we're up to point four right now. You probably get up to point eight. And at that point, we definitely have to model something because we've got zonal entropy and we've got an inflection point up here. So spherical with point four. Now, in the vertical direction, as I said before, it's one consistent shape. So I'll say that it has also the same range as the previous one in order to achieve that. Now I have ranges of 400 in the major, 250 in the minor, and so I'll use those right there. The remainder is 20% of the variability. We have this inflection point indicative of the fact that we have multiple spatial frequencies. So in the vertical direction, what I'll do is I'll say, well, we're reaching still around 20, so we'll put about a 20 of range there. Now you could, you might tweak it. You might find that your model variogram rises a little bit too high here, and you might have to play with the ranges to get it right. But you should be working with a contribution that gets you to 0.8. You don't want to change that because zone lines drop. So there might be a little play here with the actual modeling. What's happening in the horizontal directions? Zone lines drop. Set it as a large number. It levels off, and you're done. You got it. What are some more comments we can make here about variogram modeling? Well, in general, we'll find that variogram modeling is quite challenged. There's often too little data in order to infer a reliable horizontal variogram. Horizontal wells have not significantly helped with horizontal variogram inference. I should note that this is another slide that's been taken from Clinton Deutsch's material. I should add the, the, the credit here. The, so a lot of people thought when we're getting horizontal information that that was going to fix the problem, but what we're finding is that many of the times we don't have the real reliable information in the horizontal reaches and even in unconventionals where they're very long. We might have information during drilling which is less reliable, doesn't have the well logs we need. The well trajectories often don't track along stratigraphic layers, they often have cyclicity or they're moving around deviating and so that tends to provide us with not a very good indication of spatial continuity. It will, it will definitely underestimate the correlation ranges we see horizontally. We think that this could improve with time, technology improving, data collections improving. Once again, the other issue you have, of course, is that that horizontal trajectory is intercepting a relatively small volume of the reservoir. And we tend to see a lot of, you know, a lot of changes, variability horizontally. And so you could be concerned about bias or what type of information you're taking from that very small volume support and to use to model the entire reservoir. At present, we are using a lot of analog information to assist with horizontals, variograms, specifically in the presence of sparse data. And so we can use mature reservoirs, geologic process-based simulation, 
There's a lot of good work in that right now in industry and also in academia. And of course, great outcrop characterization, a lot of good quantification going out in outcrop studies. And so we need to incorporate all this together in order to work with sparse information. To, for purpose of completeness, I provide a couple more examples I took directly out of the book of barograms that were modeled horizontal, vertical, isotropic in the vertical direction, zonal anisotropy in the vertical direction with some nice multiple structures, nested structures, and here's the parameters right down here that would be used to build those models. I will record a separate video in which I will demonstrate res barogram modeling workflows in GSLib, in R, and also in Python. But for now, let, let me close up there. That's, that's way too long already. Thank you very much for your attention and your interest. If you have any questions or comments, I'm super easy to get a hold of. I'm Michael Perch, a professor here at the University of Texas, and I'm always happy to talk about geostatistics.